First of all, I'd like to thank Jan for giving me this opportunity to uh, present my ideas. Um, I'd, uh, uh, I have two things uh, I want to discuss. One is uh, toy models, which uh, um, I I'll explain. And then uh, th that leads to uh, possibilities for stochastic uh, reformulations of quantum mechanics uh, or deeper theories, which we're interested in. So uh, I'll begin with, uh, um, I, I was well, sorry. I thought it would bring up one by one rather than the whole thing together. Anyway, I'll point on them here. I'll start with Bell's theorem, and uh, I will uh, discuss uh, uh, the difference between the original formulation, which said that you couldn't uh, have locality together with quantum mechanics. Uh, and then the later formulation, the 1976 paper, he actually showed that the type of locality that you need here follows from relativity and causality taken together. So if after this point uh, we know that we have to be careful about our assumptions on locality, and people have been very careful about this, and for example, Howard has written a paper where there are like eight different definitions of locality, you know, parameter independence, uh, or you know, many different things. Uh, after 1976, we have to be careful about our assumptions regarding relativity and regarding causality. We have to be uh, a, a more careful, and very few people are actually uh, uh, trying out different types of causality. So I, I would like to, to do that uh, today. Uh, I want to, uh, you know, another way of saying this is uh, that uh, there is quantum pseudo-telepathy. It's not really magic. It's there. We have to study it scientifically. And the same reasons, you know, we, can't, we don't have signaling, um, the same reasons that this is not magic uh, are going to save us from saying that quantum pseudo-clairvoyance is magic. So it's, uh, uh, it's going to work out all right, all right I, I hope. Um, and then the last thing in my introduction is to say that quantum mechanics works very well. It's being compared to experiments. Uh, and I don't need to study that part of uh, the problem. I need to just find a reformulation of quantum mechanics, uh, which is uh, perhaps uh, uh, easier to understand. And here, of course, uh, I'm following in the steps of uh, Bohm. Uh, there's not only the deterministic Bohmian mechanics, uh, but in this book, uh, uh, published in 1957, uh, Bohm discussed the stochastic version. You have the Schrodinger waves, and you have particles following the waves. And they have to be pushed differently. It's not the quantum potential pushing them. But they, they follow the waves, and you get another interpretation, which is stochastic. So, OK. So let me start with the toy models. The toy models, uh, Ken has already described one of them. Um, you have to reproduce the results uh, of one of these quantum systems. And I'm talking about the same uh, uh, pairs of entangled photons in this case. And here are the quantum predictions. And what type of model could reproduce them? Well, um, so uh, he, here's a model that I uh, introduced uh, sort of for pedagogical purposes back in 2010. And uh, there's a variable here, lambda, which uh, describes the polarization uh, not of the photons necessarily. Imagine this is a cascade. There's a, a, an atom that is in a singlet state, it decays to a P state. It could be either PX or PY or some superposition of both. And then it further decays to the ground state, which is again a singlet. And so the two photons that have been emitted are going to be in a singlet state if we just conserve quantum, uh, uh, angular momentum. But uh, we, we could imagine that someone would measure this uh, polarization in the intermediate state. It's easy to... Uh, aim a laser at that atom and to uh, have the laser resonate with some transition from this intermediate state. And then we could know if it were a PX or a PY. And of course, that would ruin the Bell correlations. So we know from quantum mechanics that this uh, uh, orientation of the angular momentum in the intermediate state is not only an intermediate state, it's in, in a, an indeterminate state. I mean, if you measure it and determine it, you're ruining the, the whole system. So um, um, th this does give you the predictions of quantum mechanics. It's very similar to Ken's model in the limit that gamma goes to zero. 
Um, it's, it's local in a sense, but indirectly through the past, it has this non-locality that you need for, uh, quant for Bell correlations. The question, though, is how could lambda have so much information about the future? If you look at, at this variable lambda, it, it really aligns itself with either the, the polarizer, the polarizing beam splitter on the right, or perpendicular, or the left, or perpendicular. So it's one of these uh, uh, polarizations that is being uh, uh, that lambda aligns with. So infinitely many bits of information flowing backwards in time, and that's sort of funny. So it's interesting that just a few months after this came out, uh, Michael Hall published a paper where he had a different model. And uh, in this case, it's been half particles, but that's uh, not essential. You can trans transform it to photons if you like. And here again, you have a, a probability for this hidden variable depending on A and B. And, uh, uh, and here's the model, and it reproduces quantum mechanics. And in this case, the probability of lambda is spread over all of space, and if you calculate how many bits of information are uh, carried in lambda, how much information gets into lambda, think of it as a communication channel. It can only transform uh, less than a tenth of a bit per, uh, um, per uh, EPR pair or Bell pair. So uh, that's definitely an advantage over, over uh, my, the, the model that I was discussing, but um, the, the, the presentation here was not as if this is a retrocausal model. This is a, only a violation of measurement independence, and he was speaking about measurement independence implying that you're violating free will. And, and that's, so uh, I think this comes, well, at least in part from this type of presentation that Bell would give. He discussed causality, but then when he came to discuss this notion of lambda being independent of A and B, he, said, well, A and B are free variables, so they can't be influenced by anything else in your theory, and so they can't be influenced by lambda. And he sort of forgot to mention again that lambda cannot be influenced by A and B. I mean, imagine that lambda were in the future of A and B. Imagine that lambda were some variable up here. Well, of course A and B could influence it. So that's the argument we've been through this morning. So uh, you have an arrow of time Assume, uh, uh, assumption here, and that's uh, uh, central to this, and th that I think is what is being violated. So, um, originally this, uh, well, I, I, I guess I'll skip this because I, all I want to say from these couple of slides is that if you just take Hall's uh, paper and you pick out the few lines of algebra presenting the model, it is a Valid retrocausal model, very nice, a good ad, uh, advance, uh, and the other stuff just should be removed. You know, use Occam's razor to raise it off. Um, so, here's my summary of the toy models. Um, I, I mean, there there are many more. I, I haven't summarized all of them. Uh, this part is just uh, quantum mechanics, so uh, you can pull out a quantum mechanics, just a toy model, and just, I mean, I've already shown you the predictions of quantum mechanics, that's enough. Um, and I've, I've written this symbol, I have it in here to, for something that's deterministic, that's the wave function, and this is for the outputs. Uh, uh, they are stochastic. And in De Bruy-Bohm, uh, it's the other way around. The initial variables are, the initial uh, state it has some, something stochastic in it. Bell actually included the, uh, this type of toy model in his paper just for pedagogical purposes in, in his original 1964 paper. So the simplistic model that I was adding to the discussion was just to uh, demonstrate retrocausality. It's actually a bit simpler than the one that Bell used. And then there's Hall's model. And the question is, of course, how do we generalize them to a full theory? Can we get them to generalize to, at first, GHC states or something like that? and then to a full theory. Um, so that's the second part. Um, more vague, I'm afraid. I don't have any concrete models and results here. But I'd like to, uh, to start with a question of, uh, regarding time symmetry. I mean, most people who discuss uh, uh, retrocausal approaches, they seem to want their theory to be completely time reversal symmetric 
and they uh, have agents from outside that have some asymmetry in them, and we've heard that type of approach today. Uh, but I'm struck by the asymmetry of the macroscopic world, and including if the things that are interacting with quantum systems are just, uh, uh, you know, machines and not human beings, no agents there. And uh, I think, you know, in classical physics, we got used to uh, breaking the time reversal symmetry by applying a condition of low entropy in the past or by, by determining the initial conditions. And perhaps this can work here too. I mean, there's so many things that haven't been tried with retrocausal approaches. So let's, let's think of trying this. And um, if you could get the uh, low entropy in the past condition to somehow imply information causality, then you would get lots of uh, quantum uh, results which we know are, are right, like uh, Tsurilson's bound, which is the upper limit of the CHSH uh, uh, inequality if you do allow quantum uh, correlations. Um, and of course, when I speak about information causality here, I don't mean that there's absolutely no information flowing into the past because we have these toy models and there is a 0 0.1 or something bit of information flowing into the past variables. But these variables are the ones that are indeterminate or they're hidden from us. Uh, there is a no cloning theorem applying to them. We, we cannot measure them uh, without disrupting the system. So only the dissipatively measured information, only the macroscopic, uh, inf macroscopically available information uh, should count here. We should have a weaker arrow of time uh, which uh, applies only to that type of information and then everything should flow. So consider, for example, if I had a model of, of fields in space-time and I apply initial conditions and I also allow for an external perturbation to be applied at some point, some oscillating dipole. If I have deterministic models, then I would have, say, partial differential equations here. The initial conditions would completely determine what happens in the filled ovals and then only after the perturbation begins to act, you would get changes in the field. However, if you have stochastic models, even if the stochasticity is not very large and the fluctuations are limited to B of order H bar in some sense, um, the, there is something in these filled ovals which could depend on these external perturbations. And that would be the type of theory that I would want to look for. However, if I apply a detector here, I need to model the detector in some way that the firing rate of the detector would not be sensitive to the external perturbation. So somehow, but in the detector, there would be some degrees of freedom that would re be respond, respond to only to the initial conditions, and the firing rate would not depend on the external perturbation because these initial conditions are strong enough to, to determine the firing rate. Um, another uh, thing I'd like to say about this, if you have many of these indeterminate variables and perhaps some external perturbations, and you think of something that uh, you would like some mathematical structure to gather all the information you have as you go from top to bottom here, not from left to right in the Sudoku game, but from top to bottom, uh, then obviously this mathematical structure would have to be exponentially large in the number of these variables. And obviously if you have a detection event, if this detector clicks and it gives you some information about these, uh, what happened to these lambdas, then the wave function would change. The, the, whatever mathematical structure it is would change. So you would have collapse, uh, and you could perhaps think of that because this carries information about all these variables that would be an indivisible quantum of information that would be perhaps a way to describe it or to understand how it was described originally. And between the evolutions, you would have conservation of information. You don't have any change in the information you know about these variables, and therefore uh, I think that would correspond to unitary evolution. So it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, in this type of model. And then, I guess we need to uh, say something about uh, what the detector is made of. We will need to have some pointer uh, degree of freedom. Uh, we need to model the interaction. We would need to model dissipation. Uh, the pointer may need to be in a metastable state to begin with, low entropy. So it's not only in the past, but also in the past of the measuring device. And uh, the dissipation may require many degrees of freedom. In Condensed matter, we have a Caldera Leggett model which has been used uh, to describe dissipation, many degrees of freedom. Uh, you sum over uh, final conditions and, uh, and 
average over initial conditions and you get dissipation and so on. So I'd like to go back here to Bell and to quote from uh, the uh, last paragraphs in his last work on this topic. Um, he asked already then, could it be that causal structure emerges only like uh, in something like a thermodynamic approximation or a thermodynamic limit? And uh, I think uh, that is definitely part of the story. Uh, and uh, I encourage you to try to uh, work it through. Um, so I, I have the conclusions written up here, uh, but I'd like to jump to the outlook and say it is safe to trust quantum mechanics. So the best we can do is to reproduce those results unless we're going to quantum gravity and things that are outside our reach. Um, relativity is also safe. I mean, the Nobel Prize has already been mentioned. Uh, an arrow of time for macroscopically available information, I think, is also safe. But do we really need the arrow of time to be so strict as to uh, as affect information which is anyway denied to us by the no cloning theorem? This information that might sit in these variables which are uh, hidden from us anyway, I don't think we need that. So thank you. <laughs>